uh, welcome to tonight's program on juvenile crime in our community. And I really want to thank everybody who has come out tonight. I know some folks are still straggling in a bit. We do have a schedule we're going to try to stay to tonight. Um, but I really want to thank you for making time. And hopefully you'll learn some things from our panel. And we'll also learn some things from you um, as well. I really want to thank our panel members for being here tonight and making time. Um, and I'll introduce them all to you shortly. But I also want to give a special thanks to Sacred Heart University for making this incredible space available to us. Uh, it is really a treasure for our community and um, we're lucky to be able to use it tonight. And I also want to thank Fair TV who is here to record tonight so the program will be broadcast going forward on uh, FAIR TV. Um, before I continue, I do want to recognize a couple of my colleagues in the audience. Uh, State Representative Jennifer Leeper is here. And we also have State Representative Kristen McCarthy Baby. And I am expecting that we will also have Senator Tony Huang here as well. So thanks to you guys for being here and to listen to our community on this really important issue. This is the second um, meeting that I've had on this topic uh, with pretty much the same cast of characters. And the first one I would characterize as sort of an internal meeting where we just said, look, put politics aside, what is happening in our community and why is it happening? So we had a really robust two plus hour discussion uh, that was really helpful. And so tonight, um, what I wanted to do was you know, bring this to our community to hear from you. And while statistics say that crime is down and juvenile crime is down, I know for many people it doesn't feel that way. Um, some people feel less safe than they have before, and that's not just in Fairfield. I hear it quite a bit in the town of Trumbull that I also represent and in other communities across our state. You know, just in the last week alone in our community, a Fairfield resident, there was an attempted carjacking while she was getting gas, a, a elementary school teacher, at exit 22 at the rest stop. There were eight to nine car break-ins in Southport last night in Greenfield Hill. And in addition, we've had at least one home break-in as well. So tonight we want to provide some context for you on this issue. And I've asked the panel to provide an abbreviated view of what we talked about at our internal meeting. And then hopefully we can dedicate the majority of time to hearing from you in the audience. If you have experiences you want to share, if you have questions you want to ask the panel, please do. Uh, we have a microphone here and uh, you can come up and, and pose your questions. So the next part of the process will be to share feedback from this meeting to hopefully be able to shape state policy um, going forward. Uh, I know I have signed a petition to bring us in for a special session to address this issue and I hope all of my colleagues do the same. So tonight, my job is to keep us on track. Um, but first I just wanna go over our agenda and I'm gonna introduce our panelists. So uh, first, we do have our first select woman, Brenda Kupchik here, and also Gary McNamara, our former chief of police, and also the executive director of public safety and government affairs at Sacred Heart. They will also offer some brief welcoming remarks. And then we have our chief, Bob Calamaris, uh, Detective George Buckmere, and Detective Beth Le Leach, who will also share their experience from the police department in Fairfield. And then we have our state's attorney, Joe Corradino, our assistant state's attorney, John Capozzi, who primarily deals with juveniles in the court system, and our public defender, Joe Bruckman. And so once we kind of hear from the panel, uh, then we're gonna open it up to everybody to ask your questions. So uh, with that, we have a great lineup. And before we get started, I'm going to ask our first select woman, Brenda Kupchik, to please come. Uh, just welcome and um, I, I uh, had the opportunity to take part in the internal meeting that we had with uh, the, the panelists who were here tonight and our representative. 
and state senator, and you know, it's an enlightening conversation, and I hope that you do enjoy listening to it. You know, there's a lot of, as Laura said, there's, there's some politics that seem to be getting caught up in this um, discussion, and I don't really think it should be. Uh, statistics, regardless, we do have issues in town that we've talked about, and I get contacted about regularly from our residents. Um, the, the dirt bikes, the ATVs driving down our, our uh, post road, which seems like every weekend in a big pack, you know, and, and weaving in and out of cars and pedestrians. And these are not legal, these are not street legal uh, vehicles, should not be on the street. And it is a crime to be driving them on the street and putting our residents at danger. We're having car uh, break ins. We have all these different activities. And during the discussion, um, during the internal discussion, there was a, a, large, um, a large discussion regarding this turnaround, you know, that there's not just, there doesn't seem to be any consequences for actions by juveniles who commit criminal activity. And so um, I think it's a bad message for our, for our state to be sending that if you commit a crime, there is no consequence. And so I'm not suggesting, or I don't think anyone's suggesting, that we should be locking uh, juveniles up. But again, there should be some consequence. So I think this is an important discussion for not just our community, but our entire state to be having. And I'm glad that uh, Representative Devlin took the time to uh, put herself into this and to allow our community to have the opportunity to listen to some of the professionals who have to deal with this every day. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Appreciate uh, your comments tonight and the importance of this to our community. I'd also like to ask Gary McNamara to please come up and address the I didn't know if I was sitting there and talking or coming to this mic, but I will come to this mic. First of all, I want to welcome you all on behalf of Dr. Patillo and Sacred Heart University. Uh, you take a look around. This building has been in place over 100 years. So it has seen a lot. And I think one of our goals at Sacred Heart University when we entered into this partnership was to make it more of a community gathering place hold events, but at the same time, have important discussions, and why not uh, have this place, which is in the center of town, to do that. So I welcome you all. I am the Executive Director of Public Safety and Government Affairs at Sacred Heart University, sorry about that. Uh, in addition to that, I was 30 years as a police officer, retiring in 2018 as police chief. And, you know, you're not, police chiefs don't fly out of a the sky, they are police officers before they're police chiefs, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of an auto theft task force in 1991, and in 1991, auto theft was out of control in the region. Bridgeport per capita was ranked really, really high. And the success of that, so it's not a new problem, but the success of lowering that was the visionary of a former chief in, in Bridgeport, and all the collective chiefs got together and assigned people to an auto theft task force, and I know we have one now. And they combined the judges, the prosecutors, and they focused on the problem at hand. And they, you know, whether or not uh, juveniles or others went to jail for it or not, there was some significant messages being sent that this is a problem that has to be addressed. You know, we have a lot of problem finders. We need problem solvers because we're dealing with those problems. Now, fast forward to when I am chief, I retired in 2018, so I am out of the game. And I don't certainly don't know all the atmosphere and problems that are occurring now, but I can tell you in 2018, I was having this conversation with our community members. 2017, I was there saying you have to begin to understand what's occurring. There is an ongoing problem with juvenile crime that we're all facing. Now, I'm not saying that it is the same or not, but this is not a new problem. And it's important that the communities, all of our communities, gather together and come up with solutions to the problems. Because if you have an experience, it's not a problem for you. But the minute you do experience it, then you'll understand the problem that it is. So I don't have the solutions, but I, I certainly think that gathering everybody together to do it is one of the ways to do it. Again, thank you for coming. Now that you're here once, you have to come back for an event. Promise everybody here. You're here for this. Come back for something else. Thank you.
Big scary. All right, so if I could kick this off to our chief, um, and uh, Chief Palomares, we're lucky in our community, we have a long line of uh, legacy of fabulous chiefs, and our current chief right now, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Bob Calamaris. I'm the current uh, police chief in Fairfield. And, you know, one of my primary roles, um, not only for this forum, but in the town, is to uh, make people feel safe. And uh, one of the things that makes people feel safe is when there's no fear of crime. You know, because crime that's happening, and as Laura said before, uh, you know, there's statistical data that might seem different than what's actually happening. Um, the fear of crime is probably even bigger because if, if something happens to your neighbor and now in the neighborhood there's that fear that something might happen, I think that's a, that's a it's kind of a multiplying effect. And uh, the second thing is when I get uh, my officers or detectives that come in and they are seeing the recidivism rates uh, from the crimes that are being committed and then the suspects that they're taking into custody and they are the same suspects over and over again um, there's a level of frustration on their part and i'm seeing it from the community they're seeing it from the criminals you know the criminals that they're apprehending and th that's kind of my role in the, the boots on the ground they do the the harder work um, and i think my job is kind of to make it, make everyone feel like this is a safe place to live and, and that's ultimately our goal. Um, so when they come to me with these challenges, we're trying to look, as uh, uh, former Chief McNamara said, we're looking for ways to solve this problem. And I'm hoping through this forum, people get an awareness for what we're experiencing and also uh, how we're trying to mitigate that. Now, we are only one part of the, the puzzle, and there's other parts of the puzzle uh, that need to be uh, corrected, fixed, tweaked a little bit, um, however you want to interpret that, uh, there needs to be there needs to be involvement from everyone. You know, there needs to be an education component where the community is locking their cars every night. If our community as a as a whole is uh, locking their cars and making our environment safe, well, then they're going to move on to different communities to to look to uh, to commit those crimes. And ultimately, my responsibility is Fairfield. If they move to Westport, I'm actually good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually uh, pass it off to uh, Detective George Buckmere. Uh, George is, uh, actually I'll let him introduce himself. Go ahead. Okay. So George was just recently assigned to our auto theft task force in Bridgeport at the Fusion Center. And uh, I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I'm Detective George Buckmere. Um, I've been a member of the police department since 1999. Uh, 2015, I was promoted to detective. In 2017, um, actually late 2016, I started investigating auto theft on top of my regular caseload. Um, and in 2019, it became my full-time job. All I investigate is motor vehicle burglaries and auto theft that occurs in the town of Fairfield. My caseload is enormous. I'll be the first one to tell you. But I love my job, and I do take each one of those cases personally. Um, when we talk about you know these juveniles and the the, the ability or capability to repeat, you know we're gonna, we're, we're going to talk about a, a few different um, cases that we've worked on. If you look on the board, you can see some of the recent highlights, and I can tell you first firsthand that auto theft has evolved just in the short time that I've been assigned to auto theft investigations. It began as groups coming out in the middle of the night checking cars, stealing cars if key fobs were in it. Then it evolved to any time of day, four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, when people are home, didn't really matter. Again, another, you know, it continued to evolve. You're sitting at the gas station, you go inside to pay, you come out, your car's driving away. You're sitting at the gas station, um, you're pumping your gas and somebody gets in your car and steals your car or takes your purse, uses your credit cards. This is what we see. Auto theft um, kind of went away for a little while. I mean, the, the numbers uh, were, were much lower, but in the past few years, it's really skyrocketed, um, and mostly due to juvenile crime. I can tell you firsthand, uh, you know, when the chief asked me to come up here and kind of give a boots on the ground assessment 
of what we go through or what I go through and what I investigate, 99% of the people I arrest are juveniles or young adults up to the age of 22, 23. One person, going back to the older trend, right? Back when I first started here, we had car break-ins. It's always been a problem in Fairfield. But those break-ins happened as a result of drug users looking for things inside cars that they can sell or pawn so they can buy their drugs. Now it's a totally different thing. We are um, working very hard to identify these juveniles, but they often come in packs. So when we look at some of these, and we're gonna talk about um, stolen Lexus, Rams police car. Um, that just happened a couple of weeks ago. I was involved in that. Stolen Lexus, uh, stolen out of Danbury, came into Fairfield. Um, Stratford followed it into Fairfield. Um, the car was uh, turned down a dead end street. Police car went down a dead end street to block it in, turned on its lights. The car rammed the police car, took off. Um, they were eventually stopped on I-95 and two um, juvenile, well, one juvenile, one considered an adult 18 year old, both females were taken into custody. Okay, so it's not just a, a male oriented thing. We are seeing females commit these crimes. So two females, one juvenile, one adult taken into custody in that vehicle. Um, when you think about, you know, you think about these other things, and again, police, a juvenile killed in Fairfield car crash after allegedly stealing car in Westport. I was the first one on scene at that. I can talk uh, extensively about that case. And in fact, nothing better than a PowerPoint, nothing better than pictures, and nothing better than videos to prove your point when you're talking about boots on the ground and what we see. So again, some of these things are not necessarily in Fairfield, but again, cars stolen, dogs stolen, in wallet gas stations, all we're seeing is an escalation in what these juveniles are doing. Again, it's not the middle of the night. It's the middle of the day. It's at the gas station. It's walking up to the ATM. We have to be alert and we have to know what's going on. So we'll kind of move on here a little bit. So we'll talk about, you know, um, a recent case that happened over the summer that um, happened here in Fairfield and along with a couple other communities. Um, we have three juveniles. Uh, juvenile one was a 14 year old from Bridgeport and if you look up there you can see he was arrested for stealing a vehicle he was warned for breaking into cars arrested for three counts of burglary three counts of larceny and interfering with an arrest so three counts of burglary he broke into three cars three counts of larceny he stole things from three cars and interfering with an arrest he ran or fought with the police it's not typical that when they get caught they stop they run and they have no fear for their own life, for your life or ours. They have disregard for public safety. When we talk about uh, you know, some of these other things that this juvenile did, um, located running from a stolen vehicle that was taken from the metro parking lot after a motor vehicle accident. Again, now we have some other things that happened in Bridgeport, right? Larceny second, caught in a stolen car. That's usually larceny three, two, or one. You'll see those are usually stolen car charges. Credit card theft, stole credit cards, used them somewhere. So again, these are all things that I know you Fairfield residents are seeing. I know it because I deal with it, I investigate it. Um, arrested again, another stolen vehicle. So again, we're talking about a 14 year old boy from Bridgeport. Juvenile two, arrested for larceny second, stolen vehicle. Uh, arrested for breach of peace and threatening. So breach of peace, threatening, that could be a lot of different things. Um, not necessarily auto related, but definitely shows a propensity for violence, right? Um, and burglary third. Burglary third is the charge we use when somebody enters your car or enters your home. Uh, Fairfield arrests, in addition to those, uh, for juvenile three now. Uh, again, juvenile three and juvenile one were pretty tight. Um, juvenile uh, two was also a 14 year old. Juvenile three was 15 at the time of the offense but happened to turn 16 at midnight just before a major event took place in Fairfield. So um, located uh, running from a stolen vehicle uh, with Juvenile 3, uh, again from the Metro uh, train station parking lot on uh, several occasions. They were involved in three robberies between 7-5 and 7-14 of 2021. They hit someone with a car, beat him up, took his wallet and his phone. So we have physical assaults, 
Someone struck by a vehicle, purse snatchings. Two 14-year-olds and a 15-year-old from Bridgeport. Multiple bullet holes were found in the stolen car they were using. In every robbery that they committed, they used a stolen car. This is a stolen Honda CRV from Fairfield, and this is what the owner got back. They got their vehicle back damaged, and they got their vehicle back with bullet holes in it. Search warrants showed, uh, search warrants of digital devices uh, showed that uh, many pictures of these juveniles bragging with the credit cards, uh, bragging with the key fobs that they had. So if you look up here, I mean, we have a Porsche, we have an Audi, a Land Rover, and a Honda. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I don't have those cars, and I don't know how a 14 or a 15 year old has those cars either. Um, I know 14 year olds probably shouldn't have four or five credit cards on them either. So this is what we see. Social media photos. These are these three juveniles and their accomplices and what they're posing with out there. You can see one of them with a double barrel shotgun, one of them with a, uh, a revolver, same juvenile with, a, with that revolver. You can see it's loaded. You can see the bullet inside that revolver. And then uh, another accomplice or an unknown male uh, showing the extended magazine. These are the people that are coming into Fairfield. These are the people that are breaking into our cars and these are the people that are stealing our cars. Not just from Bridgeport, we're seeing juveniles from New Haven, Waterbury, and Hartford coming to Fairfield to commit these crimes. Let's see if this works. Oops. This is a video that works. Oh, now I'm getting more. Okay, that was a video, but uh, so that video would show you um, that was a group from Hartford that came into Fairfield back in 2020, um, and it shows you how they've changed. It used to be they park a car, they get out, they walk around, they go through a neighborhood. There's five or six of them. That's changed. And that's changed because of the laws and the restrictions placed upon police officers. We cannot pursue a stolen vehicle. We can't chase them. They know it and they use it to their advantage. This video shows the stolen car pull up in front of the house. Four juveniles get out. They check all the doors in the car and they quickly run back to the car. I've questioned juveniles and they said flat out, we run back to the car because we know we're safe inside that car and you can't do anything. This is what they say and they brag about it. They're not afraid to say. Um, here's some uh, recent recovered damaged vehicles. Um, the, white, the white Ford uh, was a couple weeks ago. That vehicle was recovered the morning of its theft in Bridgeport. They had the car for a couple of hours, and this is what these owners get back. Um, the other car was recovered in Wallingford. Now listen, I, I'm not very dainty with my cars. I've been known to drive them pretty hard, sorry Chief. Um, I've never ever in the equation. Um, they are taking the exhaust off of a car, just in driving. So they dumped this car, they left it on a car lot of all places in Wallingford, and then went to a gas station a few blocks away and stole somebody's car as they were pumping their gas. So again, this is what we're seeing. This is, this is the way it's evolved. When the car doesn't serve them anymore, they get a new one. It's really simple. There's a post-road fatality. You saw that up there earlier. Teen steals car allegedly from Westport, comes into Fairfield. Well, this was the car. This is what I rolled up to on scene. Um, and we'll talk about this one briefly. Um, so the call came in, uh, vehicle stolen from a gas station in Westport, um, not far from the Fairfield town line. Um, it was a vehicle from the dealership. They were there gassing it up for delivery. So there were two people there. This car was never pursued by police. Police weren't close enough to pursue it. Police hadn't even yet responded when this happened. So. Um, I happened to be working. I started heading in that general direction. It came over the radio. They're at the town line. And I thought to myself, they're going to come right into me any second. And I never saw anything until I rolled up on this. So this here was a 14-year-old Bridgeport boy with no past criminal history. So when we talk about this, wrong friends, bad decisions, 
That's where it starts. When we talk to these kids' parents, they say the same thing over and over again. He was a good boy. He still is a good boy. He doesn't do anything wrong. I don't have control over him. They don't have control over him because their friends control them more than their parents do. Nothing tells the truth better than a video. And this is the video that I came upon um, of that accident. If you look at the red uh, arrow, it'll show. This is the, you'll see the stolen vehicle from Westport go by. And I definitely don't have to point it out when it happens. You'll see it. There's the first one, and there goes the second one. So again, a 14-year-old boy was driving that car. Our accident investigators estimated that at the time he lost control, he was in excess of 100 miles an hour on the post road at 8.04 in the morning. And there was a bus in the way. That's what caused him to lose control. So these juveniles don't really have much fear for their own lives, never mind anybody else's. This video itself should show that. And you know, I'll just give you one last example you know, of you know, the, the boots on the ground kind of mentality and what we deal with. So um, last year I dealt, last summer in fact, um, I dealt with a juvenile from New Haven. He was 17 at the time. Uh, he was arrested in Derby in a stolen car from Southington. He was released at 11 p.m. At 3 a.m., three cars were stolen from Fairfield on Uncle Road. We tracked the first car to the backyard of his house. He was arrested. The other two cars, he, were, he was later arrested in, again, both those other cars. One after running away from Derby police and causing an accident. The other one was found two doors down from his house, smashed up. When I talked to him, uh, he had no desire to talk to me at all. The only thing he said in the presence of his mother is, sometimes this is the way it goes, meaning sometimes I get caught and this is what I deal with. There was a lot of investigation that went into that case, and I'll tell you, that juvenile at 17 was found incompetent and his entire record was erased. So this is boots on the ground. This is reality. This is what we deal with. This is what we see as far as auto theft investigations go. It, it can be very tiring and it can be very frustrating and it's not the court system. I know for a fact they do what they can do. But as investigators, we're losing the battle somewhere and we have to find that ground where there are some consequences because juveniles laugh at us as police officers they know they're going to be out in a few hours. I've been laughed at, I've been threatened, I've been told I'm going to stab you in the face. And these are wow. juveniles under 16. These, are, these aren't your typical Fairfield kids that we're dealing with. Thank you. Good job, George. Question. Oh, should we wait for the end for the question? Yes, sir. No, the point is, no, listen, it's an observation. It's an observation. That was the most productive presentation so far of the first couple people, and that begs a, a, a fertile ground for questions. And if you wait until the end, after each presenter has already had an opportunity, and then to go back, 45 minutes or something and bring up something, the whole thing's going to get lost. We're going to make a note. Cat, can you get him a piece of paper to write down his questions? But we're going to keep going. No, I'm not going to write down here questions. for you to come up and to be able so we can have you recorded as well. How many, so, people, how many of those juveniles did George wind up having go into juvenile detention? Because let's, let's most of the time, let's talk about the uh, the juvenile process and yes, and why there's some issues involved in that, and then that might elicit or answer some of the questions that you have. Go ahead. And I think Absolutely. you'll find how this all ties together. A, so thank you. A, we're all going to be talking about the same thing, really, just kind of. But it's a political question. It's a political question because the law does not allow juveniles to be prosecuted. You can't release their names. You don't know where they live and they only serve a minimum amount of time. And then so we are absolutely going to hit those points with these 
very experienced uh, prosecutors, they, they you know, they're gonna speak to that 100%. My name's Beth, I'm a detective with Fairfield PD. I've been um, serving juveniles in the town of Fairfield pretty early on in my career. Um, I got to do the DARE program, school resource officer, and I've been um, investigating crimes against and involving kids for the last 12 years in the detective bureau. So over that time, I've seen uh, the laws involving juveniles change quite dramatically. Initially, when um, 1998, uh, George and I got on around the same time, uh, when you would, uh, we would consider a juvenile anyone under 16. That's way back in 1998 and 2000. But there was a push to raise the age, and that started in, uh, well, it started being talked about in 2005. By 2010, 16 year olds and under were considered juveniles, which means they go just to juvenile court. And then slowly the age um, continued to be rolled in until now anyone under 18 is considered a juvenile and is sent to juvenile court if the, uh, if the violation reaches that level where it needs to go to court. Um, a part of a push that's happened from whether it's our courts, our laws, but you know, it's a great push in Connecticut to decriminalize some things involving juveniles. None of us up here want to see kids go to jail. Um, a lot of the work we do is outreach and getting kids and families the services they need. Uh, but there is a time and a place for um, saying no more and having consequences, just like parenting, just like old-fashioned parenting. And you know, a lot of times the court system needs to be the parent in some of these situations. Um, I've been very involved in building a diversion program in Fairfield. Our court system has wanted communities to have a diversion program for lower level crimes involving juveniles. So in 2014, um, in Fairfield here, we developed the Juvenile Review Board. And to get your case diverted from juvenile court, it needs to be, initially, it needs to be a first time offense, relatively minor crime, and the uh, case would not go to court, it would come to the community, and we have a great group of volunteers that serve on that board. But now we're being tasked with more and more things. We started in 2014, we've handled about 45 cases, and of those 45 cases, only two of those juveniles re-offended in their juvenile years, so that's pretty successful. But again, we're dealing with the low-level stuff, marijuana possession, possession of alcohol, um, shoplifting, you know, more minor things. Um, we've now been tasked with handling truancy cases, and um, there used to be a program for kids that have not yet reached a criminal um, violation, but parents are saying, help me, my child is out of control, they're not following the rules, they're using drugs, I'm finding drugs in the house, they're engaging in sexual behavior at a young age, like help me with these things. We used to refer them to juvenile court called Family with Service Needs, but that program has also gone away, so now the diversion program needs to handle that. The frustration with that is that the diversion program is a voluntary organization that we are trying to you know, fund and build and um, support. And it's a great idea to serve those kids in your community. And that's the only kids we take. We can only take Fairfield kids. Now Bridgeport does have a diversion program. A lot of other communities are starting up with their programs. Uh, but we're just getting really tasked with handling more and more. Now um, the the legalization of recreational marijuana has also changed the way we handle juveniles when it comes to possession of marijuana. And it's also sending a message. You know, just like these kids stealing the cars and doing the big crimes, the message when they keep getting out, getting out, is there's no consequences. You know, now our way to co have consequences for these kids bringing marijuana to school, we now have to give them a written warning the first time they get arrested. We send them to our diversion program the second time, and they t technically have to be arrested three times before we can send them to juvenile court. So uh, it's unfortunate that we are, as a community, as a state, as, as, a, as our world right now, is just sending the message that you know, it's, it's okay. And they're getting that message. Um, but we, we have been very supported by this town when it comes to kids in our town. The challenge is you know, dealing with the the more serious crimes of kids coming into our town and depending on other communities to try and handle them. I'm gonna stop there. I'm Joe Corradino. I'm the state's attorney for the District of Fairfield, which includes Bridgeport and the five contiguous towns to Bridgeport. Uh, I'm responsible for the juvenile court and the uh, 
the lower court at Golden Hill Street and the, uh, the, the higher court where we deal with serious felonies on Main Street. Uh, I think one of the most important things that we need to realize, when we're talking about juvenile crime, we are not talking about kids who are stealing cars, who are the same kids who are uh, toilet paper in trees or putting fireworks in people's mailboxes. We're talking about very serious felony crimes. Unfortunately, if a, child, if, a, if a youth is 14 years old or under, there is no way to move that case to the adult court. At this very moment, Mr. Bruckman, the public defender, is here. He and I have a homicide case. One of the people who was a participant in that case was a 14-year-old. He cannot be transferred to the adult court, and he cannot be prosecuted for murder other than Mr. Capozzi. Uh, can, uh, what's the maximum for that? It's 18, months probation. 18 months probation for killing another person. And it happened to be another 14-year-old kid. That's a problem with the law in Connecticut. 15-year-olds, once they turn 15 and up, we can bring some cases to the adult court, but only what are classified as serious juvenile offenses. Many crimes are not classified as serious juvenile offenses, including possession of firearms. And these kids can go multiple times to juvenile court for possession of firearms, and they will not come to the adult court. And honestly, in the juvenile court, uh, we do our best there, but there are very few sanctions that we can impose on juvenile offenders. I can tell you right now that in the city of Bridgeport, there is a gang war going on between several of the neighborhoods. This involves young people who are just over 18 years old, 18, 19, 20 years old, and it also involves juveniles. What's going on with the cars that are being stolen? These cars are not joyrides. These cars are being used to perpetrate drive-by shootings, including homicides. We're finding these cars up in the valley, burned, because they know that if they burn them, it'll eradicate the DNA evidence that we might find in the cars. These are sophisticated juvenile criminals. So that is a, a colossal problem. Another aspect of the car thefts is that there is a, and there's a, a a large investigation going on, a multi-agency investigation that I can't comment too much on. But many of these juveniles are being used by adults uh, to steal high-value cars that are then uh, moved out of state or out of the country and sold. So this is an organized type of criminal activity. It is not the kid next door who is just making a mistake. So, you know, make no bones about that. One of the problems we have in our state is that uh, the raise the age, as Beth uh, alluded to, these young people go directly from juvenile court until they, uh, they keep going to juvenile court until they commit a serious offense that lands them in the adult court. There's no intermediate step up where we might salvage them at some point because they understand that there are consequences for their actions. The state of the law in Connecticut has created a consequence-free environment for many young people. And uh, we don't have a second chance society. Uh, our, our former governor talked about creating a second chance society. We have five and six and seven chances for young people and for adult offenders because of the, the multitude of diversionary programs we have before anyone ever faces a conviction in Connecticut. And that's just the reality of it. Uh, I think that there are, and I, I can tell you that the, there is some action that the state has taken. Uh, there is now forming a regional task force to address auto theft. But once again, uh, there's a, it, it, it's not properly constituted. The, uh, Hartford has provided money for police overtime and all of the police agencies that we have but they haven't provided any money for technology. And it's technology that's leading us to identify who the perpetrators of the crime are. License plates readers, license plate readers, high definition cameras, 
uh, where we can capture video of people stealing cars or perpetrating other crimes from stolen cars. There's, they didn't put any money in, that, in for that. They only put money in for police overtime. So there, there are steps that can be taken. Additional steps that could be taken would be, for example, to allow us to move 14-year-olds into the adult court for serious juvenile offenses, like robbery in the first degree. I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of months ago, probably back in June, I think, uh, there, was, there were a couple of guys, a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old, who went down and they robbed both gas stations on the turnpike in Stanford. Then they came up and they robbed both gas stations on the turnpike in Fairfield. And uh, then they, the following night, they went to Brantford and they robbed both uh, uh, gas stations out there. And in one of them, an elderly lady from out of state uh, was walking out of the rest area and the 14-year-old the perpetrator grabbed her handbag. She resisted and he drove, jumped into the car and it drove off and dragged her. Mr. Capozzi and I were down at the state police station on Sunday morning uh, reviewing all the evidence and preparing arrest warrants for them so we could go and grab these guys. That 14-year-old was released right away and is back at juvenile court for another offense because we can't do anything about it. We need the legislature to give us some tools for us to ratchet up the sanctions. And, and as Beth said, nobody wants young people to go to prison. But you have to have both a carrot and a stick in addressing the problems of youthful crime. So I would suggest that we, we allow 14-year-olds to come to the adult court for serious juvenile offenses, and that we can move all juveniles to the adult court as persistent offenders. We can still treat them as youthful offenders in the adult court, but we can provide the treatment and, and help carrots, and we can provide the supervision, including detention, stick to get us to the point where we need to be. So I'm going to turn it over to John Capozzi right now. Good evening. John Capozzi, I'm the uh, juvenile prosecutor over at, at Bridgeport. I'm here, it also covers uh, Danbury area up to Norwalk also. So I've seen quite a different uh, types of kids over the years. Um, I started in probation in 1995 in the juvenile court while I was in law school. And then became a prosecutor in 2002. So I've seen how car thefts have changed. In the beginning, it was, these kids actually knew what they were doing. They, they knew how to enter a car, how to start a car, using hot wiring or whatever else to get it going without a key. Now, it's much easier for them to do that, which is, when people ask me, how do you stop it now? I said, if you lock the car and don't leave the key fob in it, they won't know how to steal it. And if you had a, a, a manual transmission, you can leave it running, and they won't take it because they don't know how to drive it. That's just the way things are now. But in comparison of what the consequences were then, years ago, compared to now, uh, I would say that the, uh, back in, uh, when I started as a prosecutor, the, the maximum sentence for certain crimes was up to four years, and you were committed to the Department of Children and Families and placed up at that Connecticut Juvenile Training School, which is now closed. Uh, it was long lane before that. Uh, or if it was a lesser, lesser offense, it could be up to 18 months in, that, in one of those placements. Those are now since that has gone, the judicial branch has taken over, and the, the, the juvenile probation department is responsible now for not only kids on probation, but also for when we try to give them the maximum sentence, which is, as I said before, 18 months of probation is the maximum for all crimes, no matter how the shoplifting to murder, that's the maximum sentence. What we do have different is because we don't have a training school anymore. We use the detention centers in Bridgeport and Hartford, there's I think 10 to 12 beds in each that could be used for what they call secure placement, which, which means they would go there for a period of time until they are, uh, could get through their steps and follow through whatever therapy they're doing there, and the, the program sees fit that they could be released to a less restrictive environment, whether that be in a placement out of the home or a placement back home with their family. Uh, now that the kids know that, 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 that this is the maximum penalty, I think that their incentive to go out and commit more crimes is increased. Uh, 
they're not getting into adult court as easily as they used to. Um, years ago, it was if you were 14 or over, committed an A or B felony, it was automatic transfer to adult court. If it was a C or D felony, it was discretionary, which meant that it was the discretion of the prosecutor whether it should go to court, as long as there was probable cause and the age was there. Now that's been taken away, that the only certain A felonies, or all, I'm sorry, all A felonies and certain B felonies are automatically transferred. All other felonies have to go under a discretionary transfer, which is not my discretion anymore. It's more the discretion of the court after a hearing that you have to show it's in their best interest to go to adult court, which is almost impossible burden. And those that have tried it around the state, most have not uh, fared well. That most of that time, the, the court ruled that that should stay in juvenile court. So many times it's, it's deemed a fruitless effort. So we try other ways to either help them or get them into adult court uh, with, some, with, with, with different kinds of charges. Now, I'm all for trying to help these, the juvenile offenders. And if we're talking just about car thieves, uh, we did come up with a, uh, judicial branch offers a motor vehicle theft program for first time offenders. And it's mostly being used for, uh, a lot of times I get cases where there's five or six kids in a stolen vehicle we don't know if they actually stole it or not because it's probably been stolen for about a week and just it happened to be their turn to go for the ride in it. So when they come to court, they're off of the program, which is they're placed under supervision for six months and they have to take classes, which kind of explains to them why this was wrong and it gives them the perspective of the victim. And hopefully they'll learn that this one shouldn't happen anymore and they, and they don't come back again. If they successfully complete the program, they, uh, the case gets dismissed. Now, it's only been in effect for about a year, year and a half, maybe two years. There's been some success, uh, but unfortunately, COVID happened 18 months ago. And as a gentleman had mentioned before about what happened, why was it so difficult? One of the things that uh, when, when the courts were not operating at 100%, judges were told to not issue orders to detain for kids unless it was something very violent, as in uh, some kind of a shooting, armed robbery, sexual assault. Uh, they were told to just turn away any other orders to detain until we could get the courts up and running and we could deal with them. So many times these cases would sit for months. And I read reports, what same kid 30 times arrested for either breaking into cars or stealing cars. And I was just as frustrated as you were. But we're starting to deal with it now. And now that the, the courts are back open again, and new procedures have been set up where judges are now able to get information from the police, it just, just came into effect maybe a couple of weeks ago where judicial branch and probation will provide records of these juveniles to the police officers when they go seek in order to detain for these car thefts or other, other crimes so that the judge has a bigger, better picture of who this young man or young lady is when they're reviewing their police report. So, As far as other things I could talk about, I could talk all night about what we deal with and what I deal with. Uh, I've seen things go from a gun case maybe one a year to now one a month. I've seen more murders than I care to deal with. Never had them before, only in the last five years. Before that, none. Now I'm dealing with several. All young people murdering each other for no reason. And what we've been trying to do is get them to the help that they need for these even minor offenses so they don't come back. And I keep telling them, my goal is to say, I don't ever see you again. One of the problems is the families. Families just either can't or, un or uh, they're unwilling to deal with the juvenile. Sometimes they have too many children, other children. They have their own substance abuse or mental health issues. So we have to try to fix everything, uh, which is a little different than in the adult court, where the adult court is just focusing on the defendant. We have the whole family to work with which, as you can imagine, is difficult. But I'll be here for questions afterwards also. Thank you. Hey, and I'm Joe Bruckman, the uh, public defender in the Part A courthouse, which is on Main Street. We don't get a lot of cases with kids who are, are 15 and 14 or 16 years old, but we do get some um, in our court because we're deemed to handle the more serious cases. Uh, we really don't get car thefts, but uh, it's interesting that one of the first officers who, who spoke uh, indicated that the, uh, he mentioned the year 1991. And this might be due somewhat to COVID in 2020, but um, 
the auto thefts in 2020 were actually 75% lower than the peak uh, in 1991. And uh, I don't know how many actual thefts, the, the auto thefts took place in Fairfield, but I know uh, from the uh, police department statistics online, there were nine arrests for either motor vehicle theft or attempted motor vehicle theft in 2020. I don't know what the, uh, the numbers are for 2021. I think a lot of, we, there are cameras everywhere. And so you get to see, you know, videos that, of a car crash that maybe we wouldn't have seen 15 years ago. Um, I mean, car, having your car stolen is certainly a, a serious thing, a, a real major inconvenience, and it certainly could lead to something worse uh, if the car is used as a weapon or is used in a, another crime. Um, uh, in the Part A courthouse, which is on Main Street, we don't get a lot of cases with kids who are, are 15 and 14 or 16 years old, but we do get some. Um, in our court, because we're deemed to handle the more serious cases, uh, we really don't get car thefts. But uh, it's interesting that one of the first officers who, who spoke uh, indicated that the, uh, he mentioned the year 1991. And this might be due to somewhat to COVID in 2020, but um, the auto thefts in 2020 were actually 75% lower than the peak uh, in 1991. And uh, I don't know how many actual thefts, the, the auto thefts took place in Fairfield, but I know uh, from the uh, police department statistics online, there were nine arrests for either motor vehicle theft or attempted motor vehicle theft in 2020. I don't know what the, uh, the numbers are for 2021. I think a lot of, we, there are cameras everywhere. And so you get to see, you know, videos that, of a car crash that maybe we wouldn't have seen 15 years ago. Um, I mean, car, having your car stolen is certainly a, a serious thing, a, a real major inconvenience, and it certainly could lead to something worse. Uh, if the car is used as a weapon or is used in a, another crime. Um, uh, but uh, my, my concern is that um, we do have diversionary programs now. And as Detective Leach mentioned, and this was for minor offenses, I think she said uh, only two out of the 45 who have gone through the diversionary program for minor offenses uh, had reoffended. And that's, that's very encouraging. And it's not a case where the, the police and prosecutor are on one side and the defense is on the other side. We're all trying to work better for, for, for all of us. And you know, the goals of helping youth uh, achieve better outcomes and protecting the public are not mutually exclusive. Because if we help the youth achieve better outcomes, they're not going to be offending. They won't be a danger to the public. So I think that statistic that Detective Leach gave us was, was very good. And, um, we just heard from the juvenile prosecutor in regard to the uh, suspension of prosecution for motor vehicle offenses. And that is an early program, um, but 82% of the uh, kids who've gone through that have had no subsequent arrests within six months after discharge. Now, you may say six months, that's nothing to an adult, but um, that's a start. And again, that program is young, and those statistics will, um, I think, be more helpful as time goes on. Um, although these, these programs are good that we have for diverting uh, kids from detention um, when it's appropriate, uh, those programs all seem to come into effect after there's some police contact. Um, what I would like to see, and, and the, the people in the juvenile public defender's office would like to see, would be some of the programs that are working that are used after someone's arrested be put into the schools um, so that we can start you know, educating some of these kids, uh, many of whom you know, don't have a father in the home. Uh, the mother, has been said, is often overwhelmed, or the grandmother, often the case too, that she's the, the main uh, parent at home. Um, and so these kids do gravitate toward something that has a structure, something that has um, I guess a chain of command, and so they start hanging around with other kids in many cases. So um, there are programs now um, that involve people from the same neighborhood, where, for instance, some juveniles may be, and they've gone to prison before for committing offenses. And those, um, I think it might be called a safe street program, those are very successful. If a person comes and says, look, I was your age, I did the same knucklehead things you did, look where it got me. 
uh, you know, avoid that. Um, so that's, that's very persuasive. It's persuasive is more persuasive than, uh, you know, State's Attorney Corey Dino or I going into a school and telling you what we see from the law side of things. Um, but if we can put that sort of thing in the schools where someone who has the experience, um, you know, can tell about, look, this is the road you're going down. Because in many ways, the schools have taken the place of parents in a lot of ways. Uh, when there's just not proper parental direction at home, uh, the schools have to take on some responsibility that, you know, back when I was a kid, they didn't do that. Um, so that's about all I have to say, uh, other than uh, the current laws, and again, I'm not an expert on the juvenile um, system in the public defender's office, but <clears throat> uh, those who do run the juvenile uh, division of the public defender say that uh, the present laws recognize there are situations where youth may need to be detained or placed in secure residential settings to help address their own needs, as well as to promote public safety and permit, and permit that when necessary. I think we should just avoid the temptation of lumping all juveniles into, you know, what we see on the screen in a video or some pictures. Everyone is an individual and have to be sort of assessed individually, um, but we can help them. I mean, the programs that are, wor are working now, and I think as time goes on, uh, hopefully the programs will continue to improve uh, the outcomes. Great, thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists. I think they were able to paint a picture of not just sort of what the current situation is, but also a desire for solutions and some compassionate ideas that would help with the goal being of helping some of these kids. But I, if anyone could join me in a round of applause for our panelists, I thought they were great. We are moving to the part of the program that you've been waiting for, um, and we want to hear from you. So we do have a microphone up front, uh, the only thing that we would ask is just sort of distance yourself, um, and it is requested for the floor microphone that you do wear a mask while speaking into it. If you're not comfortable coming up to speak and you have a question, uh, if you haven't already, were there any cards that you had so far? Okay. Um, please raise your hand and Kat will give you a card, but we welcome uh, hearing from you. Uh, while you're contemplating that, we did ask uh, when people registered if they did have questions to please submit them. So we have received several questions and a couple of comments. So I'll start with those and then please feel free to come up. We would welcome to hear from you. Um, so these are all anonymous questions, but I'll start with the first one. Uh, and I'll just throw it out there. You guys let me know and um, we're gonna keep this kind of uh, how were these situations handled 10 to 15 years ago? If they were handled differently, what changed and why? I think you touched on some of that, but. Um, one thing that I, I spoke about the last time, just, you know, when we talk about this, it brings up remember, uh, memories for us about what it was like way before, but I'll never forget, and George can echo my same feelings, like when you had to take a juvenile into custody, and put them in the back of your police car and transport them to juvenile court, they were likely going to get released the next morning, but there were certain laws uh, that if they were violated by a juvenile, it was considered a serious juvenile offense, SJO was a term we were very familiar with, and for those types of things, um, we're like, sorry, young man, young lady, you're coming with me tonight, and we'd have to call the parents and say, we're transporting your child to Bridgeport Detention Center. You can." coordinate with them as to where you can pick them up. And many parents were like, take them. You know, this child needs to experience this. Like, we, they are out of our control. So it, it was an experience for that child. And of course, at the detention center, they're very well cared for. And um, there's staff there. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear maybe some of the kids that we, that George deals with, especially, they're like, go ahead, drop me off, it's fine. But that experience of being transported to juvenile detention center did something 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the 16 and the 17 year olds that we dealt with were treated as adults. They were driving cars. If they were committing a serious crime, like they, they had, it was public information when they were arrested. And there was, it was, to me, working with high school kids 10, 15 years ago, it was more of a deterrent. Um, so now anyone under 18 is so protected. It's not public information when they get arrested. 
we can't lock them up, as Mr. Capozzi was just saying, like that 18 month of probation is the most he can give for these even very serious crimes. So I see that in my experience as a serious uh, change that the experience of going to jail is really no longer for these for these juveniles. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to follow up uh, with respect to the 16 and 17 year olds 10 to 15 okay. years ago. The kid got arrested in a stolen car 10 or 15 years ago. He would go to the adult court on Golden Hill Street. And that kid would walk in and he'd sit there with all of the other adults who were charged with crimes. And he'd see what happens to them. And typically what we would do with a kid that is, we had the youthful offender program, which still exists. We would put the kid in the youthful offender program and we could give him up to, actually we could put him in jail for up to three years, but we didn't do it. We would usually give him probation something like 18 months or two years suspended and put him on probation for three years. Make sure he got his uh, high school diploma. Made sure he was working. The probation officer would supervise him and get him into programs if the kid uh, uh, needed substance abuse or if he needed some type of counseling. And because the 16 and 17 year olds stay in the juvenile court, we can't do that for them. So that's, one, that's another big change. Thank you. Um, here I, I was going to say also, in the comparison, since I was there both times, I remember there was, when, it, when you told a kid, you know, you, when you had the serious charge, you were going to adult court, they were scared. And they would do anything not to go to adult court, including, they say, I'll plead out to whatever charge and just keep me in juvenile court to get the help. They're not afraid anymore, like they used to be. Um, also, uh, Larceny 1 used to be automatically transferable back 10, 15 years ago. That's not the case anymore. Um, but again, I think that you know, one of the solutions would be if we had more tools to, 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 not that we have to use them all the time, but at least say you know, there is an incentive for you to behave yourself because it's, it, you could go to adult court easier. Uh, that's what worked before, but it doesn't work that way anymore. Even 10, 15 years ago, there was no limit on how much probation you gave them. You could give them five years of probation in juvenile. There was no statutory limit. Now they limited it. Uh, so again, a lot of the kids are thinking, well, it's worth the stretch to do, the, to do what I want to do. All right, thank you for that. So sort of related to the answers that you guys gave to that question, I want to jump to this one that was submitted. And it sort of relates to the, it was presented in terms of the pandemic, but I think the point might be relevant. So um, related to the pandemic, the question was, you know, how many people have been confined to homes where they've experienced mental and or physical abuse? Um, but the part that struck me based on your answers were, do we want severe punishments for young people who may have suffered already? In some sense, you have to trust the system. Joe Bruckman and I, most of the time, come to an agreement on how we should handle a criminal offender, whether he's an adult or whether he's a juvenile. And uh, by hemming us in and not giving us a little discretion, uh, we can't do as much for people. Uh, I, without going into too much, there's a pending case, a very serious crime that resulted in a death. And while I was at the police station, uh, one of the police officers said that they remembered that offender from when he was a kid. Uh, and he had been molested in the past. That piece of information about that kid that that police officer knew is passed on to me. And I'm dealing with that uh, kid's lawyer now. And I'm taking that into consideration. And uh, building into the disposition of the case. Now, this is a young person uh, who's, I think, 19 or 20, so he's not a juvenile, but he's just over from that age cadre. Uh, and, and we factor those things in. We do have an adversarial system, technically, but as a practical matter in Connecticut, 99.5% of all cases are settled by agreement. We couldn't possibly try them all. And so what we do is we hammer out an agreement that addresses the best interest of a kid. And if the kid's in a bad environment, that gets factored into the outcome. 
Thank you. I appreciate that perspective uh, that you offered. So uh, sort of a different direction. Can the police get creative and employ other strategies? Tire strips, drones, cop cars at highway entrance? So uh, we have. We've had, um, so spike strips are uh, one of the tactics that we do deploy uh, when it relates to uh, stolen vehicles. Uh, we do uh, post up, and, and not to talk about all the tactics that we use, but uh, we do post up on the highway exits and entrance ramps and we know that a vehicle was stolen. Uh, oftentimes, uh, with these, some of these newer cars, uh, when the vehicle is stolen, it alerts the owner of the vehicle, and within minutes sometimes we know uh, that the vehicle was stolen and we'd be able to post up in the area to uh, locate them. But then, when we do that, our hands are cuffed and we can't pursue. Now, you know, that's another, that's another uh, topic that relates to, you know, to what extent do we want to pursue, you know? Um, we're gonna locate the vehicle, ultimately it's a property crime, uh, but then we go back to, you know, do we want these type of crimes being committed into in our in our communities? Um, you know, one of the things that stood out uh, while while Joe was uh, speaking, um, when we had our last session, one of the detectives that was speaking said that, you know, we had a kid come in and he was 14 years old, and they caught him with a stolen car and arrested him, you know, two or three times within a 10-day period, and uh, the kid said. I can't read or write, what do you expect me to do? So he's 14 years old, he can't read or write. You know, going back to the diversionary programs, you know, that's, you know, we, we don't take that lightly, you know, but that is, I feel like we're, we're kind of in this cyclical thing. If there's no, no other choice for this child to learn and um, get an education or make it better for himself, we need to provide that, or the parents. Um, and I can tell you countless stories where the parents come in and say, take them, take my child, do something with him. Make him or her stop doing what they're doing. Um, and, and you know, that's really the frustrating part, because the last thing we want to do is lock up a kid. That is the, you know, that's the last thing we want to do. We want to find alternative solutions to divert the problem or to make them better so that they're, they realize that what they've done is wrong and they, they can move, up, move on and be a, a productive member of the community. Thank you. So, any questions yet from the audience? I'm going to invoke, we have a microphone right here. I don't really need a microphone. But I got a couple questions. One is, uh, Sir, so we can't hear you. You got it without a microphone. Can't hear It is, and thank you. My so I, have, I have a three minute clock, you're not gonna like that either. But I said I have a three minute clock. I said you're not gonna like that either, but that's the way we do it. Yeah, it's a three minute question and answer. Okay, look, my hat's off to you, you do a great job. Uh, I know there's other states that have websites where they report crimes in the area. You can do auto theft, robberies, you know, burglaries or something. Does the Fairfield Police Department participate in something on a website where you can track in individual real-time violations of crime, we'll say? So we, we advertise our, our uh, cases. Um, yeah, we advertise our cases not only in our social media, but also um, we share all the cases that happen with uh, the local news media. So. For the most part, they get everything that we have. And but they, I mean, you don't have a website that you can click on and you could say carjackings, car burglaries, robberies, and then you get a pinpoint on a map, territorial map, that shows color-coded indications of what occurred at that location. We do not do that. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know at one time, this may go back many years, 25, 30 years, that the Fairfield Citizen had a, a space in the paper that would record police notes where you would be able to read it and you could get 10, 15, or 20 different the crimes that blotter. were committed. Yeah, the blotter. 
Pardon me? It was called the blotter. Police blotter. The blotter. Police yeah. blotter. Yeah. Is that still in existence? Because I haven't seen it in the Fairfield Citizen at all. It, it is. Um, it's, it's shared a little differently. Um, we share it with the local media, and they decide what they put out and what they don't. Mm -hmm. So we, we share that. We also post it up on our... Uh, we also post it up on our web page every month. We have a monthly report. You can see all the crimes. Okay, that so it's on the monthly web page that you have? It's on the Fairfield Police okay. web page. And, the month, and if you just go to the monthly report, okay. you can find all the statistics. Does the Fairfield Police Department have a neighborhood watch program? We do. Okay. And how is that handled? How do you participate in something like that? If a neighborhood wants to have uh, like a watch captain designated to... Yep. Whatever we we have that um, you can get more information on our website. That's on that. the answers yeah. on our website. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, you guys do a great job. Thank you. Uh, let's just be thankful we don't have some of the issues that other areas do. But I notice, like, uh, it's only a comment. I notice I get the Bridgeport Post with the Fairfield Citizen, and I notice that the headline of today's our uh, today's headline in the Fair in the Bridgeport Post was that you know people were trying to understand why there's an increase in gun violence. And they talked about New Haven, Hartford, uh, where over the past year it was, past year it was 20 homicides, and this year so far it's up to 22. And you know that doesn't look like a major increase when you consider where Chicago stands, or California. And I'm just wondering, when you look at planning for the worst case scenario. Is there a situation that has been devised on how you're going to handle increasing crime from people that don't live in the area that want to bring that kind of stuff? Because you could look at California and people walk into a place in San Francisco and they walk out of a Walmart with thousands of dollars of electronic equipment every day and there's no police arrest. There's no prosecution, which is where it stems from. There's no prosecution of the individuals because they're all sanitized and they say, well, leave them alone, they, you know, whatever. And therefore, it's basically uh, lawless wild west out there, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're pretty fortunate in, in this town that we're not seeing uh, regular cases of these, uh, the types of incidents that you're describing. I think. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing a, a rash of uh, stolen cars. That's kind of what we're um, looking at right now. That seems to be what, you know, car break-ins and stolen cars is kind of where we're fo focusing our attention because those crimes are leading to greater crimes. Yeah, well, we know from the playbook of crime, okay? It used to be 40 years ago, don't do the crime unless you do the time. Okay, that was a great TV program that everybody watched, Beretta, I guess it was. But the thing is, the criminals know that they can get these kids to be mules, to do the crime, and they say, don't worry, you're gonna be out in the street, you're not gonna get a record, it's gonna be sealed, you're gonna get probation, and then we'll rotate you someplace else, and then they'll bring somebody else in. So the final question I have is, when we were talking about... That'd be the final one. Okay, okay. okay. Six minutes. Well, I've got a lot of questions. So That's right, you can come back. I'm a law question. and order guy, okay? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. When someone gets arrested in Fairfield that's a juvenile, my understanding is his record's sealed, he's released, and whatever, whatever system he goes in, everything is not expunged, it's just sealed, okay? If that kid gets arrested in Hartford for the same crime, which is, we'll say, carjacking or a felony gun violation, okay, that record's going to be sealed. It's going to be adjudicated somehow. It's not going to rise to the level where he's going to be incarcerated, okay? Does the Fairfield Police Department get a report from that area that, oh, this kid Oh, he was in your area a month ago, and he committed a crime up here. Or does the sealing of the of the records prevent individual jurisdictions from seeing what's happening? Because these people could be going around in a circle, and you just never see them for a second time. Right. 
Yeah, we, we have great cooperation from other PDs, but for juvenile records, we have to ask. We have to, you know, we have to either hear, uh, George is on the pulse of that too, like working with other police departments in the area and say, oh, I've had that kid or, but if we've done our Fairfield case and it's now in the hands of the court, so if the, that juvenile court with Mr. Capozzi, he can see that record and Hartford can see the Fairfield record. Just because it's not public information doesn't mean that the court system. So Hartford PD is gonna do their job with that juvenile. Fairfield PD is gonna do our job with that juvenile. We're gonna send them to court and Mr. Capozzi and any prosecutor is gonna be able to see in live or in real time what cases they have going on and what their consequences right. are. But what triggered the question was the fact that nobody's advised that this person reappeared because there were people put it into an area and they didn't do anything for 18 months according to your records and therefore he's not doing whatever. But could he be doing something someplace else that nobody's aware of because the records are sealed? He could be doing things. It's not our job, though, to manage the other time. It's the job. court's job. Yeah. So uh, if you could just, do you want to address that briefly, and then if you have additional comments or questions. I have no can... more comments. The, the, the answer is yes. I would know everything that kid is doing statewide. You would know statewide? Correct. Would you notify the Fairfield Police Department that this kid you arrested uh, as a juvenile six if, months if ago this some, is yes. a repeat offender? And yes. therefore, if you catch them again, that's a third strike or something. If they needed that information, I would that would make I would make it available to them. All right, thank you would very you do much. Would you do that automatically, or did somebody have to request something? I, I'm all alone over there, so I would do the best I could. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate well, your interest in this issue. You. Let me tell you. Staffing is a big issue in the Division of Criminal Justice. Um, in this district, we're down four prosecutors from where we were in January of uh, 2020. Uh, John's the only juvenile prosecutor that we have. And uh, with technology, our workload is about doubled. Uh, but uh, there is no more money for staffing in the Division of Criminal Justice. And our headquarters uh, doesn't pass out additional personnel very generously. So. Uh, just to, to follow up on something the gentleman said, uh, my office is not like Philadelphia or Chicago or California. Uh, we don't decline to prosecute classes of crimes. If a person commits an offense, they're brought to court by the police, whether an adult or a juvenile, and we adjudicate those crimes appropriately. At some point, we, they, we may choose to drop the charges, generally, uh, on the strength of the evidence, yeah. uh, but oftentimes because the person is diverted into some program uh, that, including our own of our own initiative, that will uh, help them to not come back. Uh, but uh, but we we don't uh, decline to prosecute whole classes of crimes in, in in this state and especially in this district. Thank you. Please, and I should have asked if you wouldn't mind just stating your name. Uh, on the strength of the evidence, uh, but oftentimes because the person is diverted into some program uh, that, including our own of our own initiative, that will uh, help them to not come back. Uh, but uh, but we we don't uh, decline to prosecute whole classes of crimes in in this state and especially in this district. And I should have asked if you wouldn't mind just stating your name and where you're from. Hello, my name's is, my name is Loretta J. Thank you, Representative Devlin, for hosting this event. Thank you all of the panelists for taking this time to speak with us. Um, I have more of a commentary than question, but it may grow into a question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit distressed when I hear a lot of talk about changing the punishment or having consequences be adult, being charged as an adult. Um, I would much rather see additional resources put forward to the diversion programs that have been mentioned and others to giving more teeth to juvenile crime. But what we know, we've learned our lesson, sadly, what happens to the juveniles being put into adult, the adult system. 
it's, it's just throwing them away. It's spending a lot of money, and they, so we're throwing them away. If we could take that money, and I, I'm sorry, I can't read that as well, and I don't have her name. I appreciate the reference to, thank you. I appreciate the reference to limited budget from limited staff. I understand, just, I work with DCF. I created a diversion program that Bridgeport Health Department implemented. I worked in the 90s through, through the systems. I know what that's like. If we could take the funds that we would be, legislators, I'm really glad to see you all here. If we could take these funds and apply them to services, diversion programs, not, please, not adult treatment. That's not the answer. It's expensive and it's not gonna solve any problem. I, I would be very happy to go on, but I don't wanna take up too much time. It's my, my spiel. No, I think Thank we're you. all 100% on board with you. We want those diversion programs but just like hard parenting, it, you know, there comes a point where if you say, don't do that because it's not safe, you're going to hurt yourself, you're gonna you know, harm your brain, your whatever, you're gonna fly out of a car at 125 miles an hour in the center of Fairfield, there comes a point where are we hurting our youth by giving them no consequences? Uh, and that's my concern, I mean, I spend so much time, you know, I've been supported by my chief to create these diversion programs. We want to serve the youth in our community. We want to see good things. We're supported by awesome people in this community that want the same thing. But we can't control the kids that come from New Haven. We can't rehab them in Fairfield. We can't help the Bridgeport kids. Like, that has to be Bridgeport's problem. So yeah, there needs to be funds to do those diversion programs, but there needs to be some backup. There needs to be a final answer that says, we're gonna help you, we're gonna help you, we're gonna help you, but there is a final word here. And we don't really have a final word right now. That's what it feels like. I, I hear that, and, and, and there's no denying what, what's going on is terrible. It's a horrible situation, we have to come up with a solution. Um, is there a way, and I don't have the answer, this is a question, is there a way to put sufficient teeth into our juvenile system so that we're not charging our 14 and 15 year olds as adults? Is it, can we do that? Remember that even if 14 and 15 year olds come to the adult court, they can still be adjudicated a youthful offender. And in fact, when they're transferred over, they're, they're brought in as youthful offenders. We have to move them off of the youthful offender docket. So that is available. That's the intermediate step up from no consequences in juvenile court to getting convicted as an adult. It's that middle ground and that's what's missing right now. Uh, I can tell you that among juveniles, uh, and that's people under 18, uh, when they go out to do a robbery with a gun, the, the slang term on the street is to call that crime a stain. Because if somebody resists, they're going to shoot them. That's not a person who um, a timeout and counseling is going to stop from committing that crime in the future. So at some point, we have to increase the exposure. Now, I think if we, if we do it right, and we use the youthful offender statute in the adult court, and use the panoply of resources that the probation department has, uh, then we're on to the right track for most of these kids. But there are a tiny number of them who do need, who are sociopaths, and they're just not called sociopaths because that's a, uh, a psychological identifier that gets hung on them after they're 18 years old. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder is what they have as youths, but they are bad, and we do need to have some resources to address the, the very small slice of, of the, uh, that age cohort that are committing very serious crimes. One of the things that's underway, uh, I could be wrong, I believe it's being looked at, is um, so our tiny little state of Connecticut has more diversionary programs than any other state in the nation. And I support the approach of let's do something else for these kids, but that seems to have been approached over and over again. And honestly, I don't know if they're either not functioning, not funded, they are funded and aren't performing, 
but I believe there's sort of an audit underway. Um, if I'm wrong on that, there needs to be an audit underway uh, because we really need to make sure we're uh, helping these kids. Uh, we've got 30 minutes left, so I'm gonna use moderators and I'm gonna let you ask one question. Uh, I'm a reporter, first of all, but um, you just mentioned that there, like, the Connecticut's uh, you know, one of 50 states, obviously. Is there a trend that shows in any of the other 49 states, presumably there are some with harsher penalties and more tools available that you recommended, that there is less of a problem with juvenile crime and, and or auto theft? Well, can you just mention who you are referring to? Oh, the Connecticut folks, Ethan Fries. And then just like, All right, we have a mask mandate, we all have one of you are unmasked, so I was just wondering like, why. Because within this facility, performers and people on stage, it's not a requirement. Okay, thank you. Yep, you got it. All right, so listen, I'm gonna use moderator's privilege here, and with our last 30 minutes, I have a question, the same question for each of you, and Gary, we're gonna start with you and just go down the line. If there was one thing that you could change that would make a difference, what would you do? What would you suggest to us? Tough one, huh? You mean for this topic or just in general? Pardon me? Well, there's a lot of things that I would change. So, uh, to have a community that is aware that this is a huge problem and a community that recognizes that there are professionals who you all pay for to provide information and they're trying their best to protect all of us and they're telling you what the problems are and I would make people more aware of that and understand that you get the police you get the safety that you demand. And there are individuals that are being killed as a result of these problems. I'm going a little longer, and we have to understand that, we have to recognize that these are the professionals that have been doing it a long time that say we have a problem and we're trying to help, but we have to figure it all out. Um, I think one of, the, one of the challenges we face as police officers is that um, we are the executive branch of government we fall under the executive branch of government. And when we, uh, we are given these individuals or these juveniles back to then uh, conduct a juvenile review board, we have uh, Detective Leach here who runs the juvenile review board, the JRB. Um, in my opinion, that is a component of the judicial branch. And if they are gonna refer them back to us, I think it should either be community members, which is really what it's supposed to be. That was ultimately the goal, but they kind of give it to the police department because we know the players that are involved. It shouldn't be us, because now we're covering two forms of government, and you know we make the arrest, and then we're now getting, a, having a say in what punishments are placed upon these juveniles. I think that needs to be separated. I think community members need to get more engaged in these juvenile issues so that um, we don't play two parts of that. We shouldn't play two parts of that. Um, that's my opinion. I'd like to change that. Thank you. George? I, I think I'd like to see, um, I have the backing of my chief, I have the backing of my police department, um, and when I start investigating these cases, I, I kind of don't feel I have the backing of the state of Connecticut. Um, I think we do need to see some kind of consequences placed on juveniles who are committing these repeated offenses. We're not talking about juveniles who make a mistake one time. Um, I'm talking about repeated offenses. You know, I, I didn't do a lot of stuff when I grew up because I knew my parents held me accountable and I had, uh, uh, there were going to be consequences to whatever I did. Um, I, I heard somebody say earlier, you know, the timeout, that's not gonna work with some of these kids. Um, so I think we need to uh, put some kind of bite in the juvenile justice system and that 
doesn't necessarily start with us as police officers because once we make the arrest, it's out of our hands what happens. Um, it has to start in Hartford and work its way down. Thank you. Beth? Yeah, I would echo the same feeling. Like there just needs to be teeth in that program. When I sit with a juvenile and their family and sign them up for the JRB, and you know, this is kind of like this is step one. Okay, you've stepped into an arena where now you're at the police department. You're meeting with a detective. We're going to divert this away from the court. They'll never learn your name. You don't have a criminal record if you complete this program. But it's nice to be able to say, if you at some point say, this is too hard, I don't want to do my community service. I don't want to have to talk to the community and talk about what I did. It's nice to say, that's your choice. You know, you have this program you can participate in or you can go to court. And once you start the court procedure and you end up there five, six, even 10 times, 15 times, but is there a final result? Like, we just need some teeth, we need that backup. Thank you. Joe? I would say if I had one choice, it would be the ability to move serious juvenile offenders who are 14 to the adult court, and all uh, youths between 14 and 18 uh, who are persistent offenders to the adult court. Thank you. Jan. Doing this for so many years, I really enjoy the work, and I really love being able to try to help the, the juveniles straighten their lives out. Uh, I'm not just uh, looking to send everybody to adult court. I would love to use the programs we have, but I I agree with Mr. Cordino. We need that discretion of 10 years ago back where we could do it. Not that we have to, but we should be able to do that and not be prohibited from doing so. I think that, that it, the incentive that's out there would, would make it a little easier to uh, do our jobs and let the police do their jobs. Uh, but again, we can, I could also use the programs that we would have available to help the juveniles who maybe aren't getting into as many serious problems, uh, to help them out. So, thank you. Thank you. Joe. Uh, to sort of expand on what I said earlier, um, I think these are all uh, reasonable suggestions uh, coming from the, you know, the different points of view, but I still look at the need to help these kids before there's police contact. Because by the time they've done something wrong, for many of them, the die has been cast, their character has been shaped, and what we need is more mentors. I'll just tell you a quick story. I have a kid now who's 20, but I represent him since he was 16, and um, you know, he texts me his report card the first day of school. And this is from the Bridgeport School. I didn't, I don't, know if Fairfield, I don't think Fairfield does it this way, but he showed me his report card. He already had two A pluses on the first day of school. To me, it was a little ridiculous, but he was so proud of that. He wanted to share it with somebody, but he's got no one at home to share it with. And I think if we make, if we get people to volunteer and see the need for mentors for these kids who have no guidance, I think that would cut down a lot on the cases coming in to the court system. Thank you. I think Joe Bruckman is right. I think Joe Bruckman is right. One of the things that is missing uh, in the lives of these young people is that sort of proper structure and well-modeled behavior. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, I was at a uh, Project Longevity meeting. Project Longevity is a program funded by the federal government that tries to get uh, offenders who are coming out of jail lined up with resources and uh, job training. Uh, they even have had like bags of groceries for the people to take home uh, when they attended the meetings. And I'm supposed to go there and tell them that you know if you if you get in trouble again, I'm going to send you back to jail. I'm the the hammer uh, in that program. Uh, but the idea behind the program is to get them onto the right path. And the kids, and they are kids. They were. 18, 19, 20, 21. We were over in um, uh, Sacred Heart Church on the east end of Bridgeport, in the basement there at this meeting. A week later, I was at the Golden Hill Methodist Church for a Boy Scout meeting. Uh, a friend of mine knows that I was involved with scouting. He asked me to sit on a board of review for a young man who was going to rank up uh, to, uh, I believe, Life Scout. And 
I said to the boys at the Boy Scout meeting, I told them about the meeting I was at uh, earlier in the week. And what a contrast between those boys whose parents, very often very close to the margin as far as making ends meet, were scraping up money for them to participate in scouting. And they, were, uh, and they had adult leaders who were showing them how to do things, to acquire skills, to move up in rank, to listen to each other as boys, to listen to their boy leaders. And contrast that with the young men who had gotten out of prison that were in Project Longevity. And they had fallen into gang violence, being led by other boys or other young men into criminal activity. And there's the huge contrast. If, and I think Joe is right, we address youth crime before it happens by having wholesome activities for young people to be involved with and by having adults modeling appropriate behavior with them and having the young people take responsibility for their own activities. And I, I really think that that is the, uh, now maybe it's utopian to say that, uh, but I do think that that is the way it, uh, to keep young people from falling into criminal behavior. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate your, your, each of you, your responses, and particularly Joe and Joe, your closing comments, because it feels as though, you know, there may be a stereotype about the way that any of you would be approaching this, and you've really ended, I think, on a note of compassion. And really the efforts are to try to intervene and help these kids in the middle that are repeat offenders not end up as career criminals. So thank you. I'd like everybody to join me in thanks for our panel. I hope that you have enjoyed tonight's program or found it informative. Uh, as a delegation, Senator Wong, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and Representative Leeper, we will be having more conversations and uh, hopefully yet this month we'll be able to address this issue in Hartford and we'll certainly be sharing some feedback uh, with our judicial committee members and our, and our leadership. But thank you to everybody for taking time out tonight. Fair TV will be airing tonight's program so you can watch it again or share it with friends. And I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. And thank you to our first elected member, Brenda Cupcheck, for spending the evening.